Our message today is called The Omega of Apostasy. The Alpha happened with John Harvey Kellogg and his, bringing in, his attempt to bring in pantheism into the Advent movement. Ellen White met that uh, attempt head on, and uh, the Alpha uh, was, um, that battle was won with the Alpha. But Ellen White predicted that the Omega would come and it would be of a most startling nature. God meets watchmen today. He used the Jewish church to, to block the light of Christ Messiah as the lamb in the courtyard. He used the Roman Catholic Church to block the light of Jesus as our great high priest in the holy place, the heavenly sanctuary. And now he wants to block the light of Jesus Christ in the most holy place. Three attacks into the glorious lamb. Here's a picture of John Graz and William Johnson at the Global Christian Forum in 2007, Nairobi, Kenya. This was at a religious meeting, probably on Sunday, ecumenical meeting of religious leaders all over the world. And the Omega of Apostasy is the most important event in Adventist church history. That very few people have even heard about it or know about it. And if they know about it, it's not much about it. It's an event where three fundamental SDA doctrines were repudiated in 1955 and 56. The truth about God, the truth about Christ's humanity, and the truth about Christ's work of atonement in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Um, what is Christ, Christ wanting to do for his people at this time in his most holy place ministry? to blot out our sins and, and to do that work he needs the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin and of judgment and of righteousness Amen. so these three doctrines have to do about the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit the heavenly trio and each one has a role in our salvation that is vital and all three doctrines were found in the 1872 Statement of Principles. How many have heard of the 1872 Statement of Principles? Just two people. I just learned about it uh, a few years ago. But um, this was original Adventism that was repudiated in 1955 and 56. Mm -hmm. In the 1872 Statement of Principles, it says in Statement Number One, there is one God, a personal, spiritual being, the creator of all things, everywhere present by his representative, the Holy Spirit. Doctrine number one in the 1872 state, uh, principles, this is the first doctrine that was repudiated in 1955 and 56. And number two, statement number two, it talks about one that there is one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Eternal Father, the one by whom God created all things and by whom they consist, that he took on him the nature of the seed of Abraham for the redemption of our fallen race. And that was the second doctrine repudiated, that Christ came in our fallen humanity, the seed of Abraham. Right. This second statement continues. It says that, uh, he ascended on high to be our only mediator in the sanctuary in heaven, where with his own blood he makes atonement for our sins, which atonement, so far from being made on the cross, which was but the offering of a sacrifice, is the very last portion of his work as priest. And so this teaching is that Christ is, went to the heavenly sanctuary to uh, perform the final work of atonement for us, to cleanse the sanctuary from sin, from all of our sins, according to the example of a Levitical priesthood. And this was the third doctrine that was repudiated in 1955 and 56. We'll look at each doctrine carefully. The first doctrine, the original SDA church believed in the heavenly trio with the Father as the most high God of the three in the plan of salvation 
Jesus and the Holy Spirit have taken a subordinate position to the Father. Jesus was equal to the Father, but in the plan of salvation, he has taken a subordinate position along with the Holy Spirit. The heavenly trio. In statement number, just going through, we see that there's one God, the Holy Spirit, and one Lord Jesus Christ. The original Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1872 believes in, believed in the heavenly trio right there yes. in point number one and two. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 teaches the same thing. In verse 4, there is one Spirit. Verse 5, one Lord. In verse 6, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So we have one Spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. One plus one plus one equals three. And that's the heavenly trio. The Bible teaches the heavenly trio. Three distinct eternal beings. Revelation 14, 12. The last verse of the three angels' messages. Here is the commandments of God. Here is the faith of Jesus. Where is the Holy Spirit? He's in the next verse. Yea, saith the Spirit, <coughs> that they may rest from their labors and all their works do follow them. So the heavenly trio is there in the three angels' messages. John 14, 16. Jesus is talking. He says, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another Come. comforter. The heavenly trio right in that verse that the Holy Spirit may abide with you forever. Isaiah 48, 16, this is Jesus talking, and he says, Come ye near unto me. Hear ye this, I have not spoken in secret. From the beginning of the t from the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God and his Spirit hath sent me. Have me feel in the Old Testament as well. Clearly seen. The Father is the Most High God in the heavenly trio. This is clearly seen in Mark 5 or 7. And he, this is the demon talking here. He cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? So the Father, when you see the phrase in the Bible, the Most High God, that's always referring to the Father. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. This is very close to the 1872 statement of principles. A clear, thus saith the Lord. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. For there is one God, and if you type in uh, one God into Esau, it's always referring to the Father. In the Bible, for some reason, I don't know. I can't explain. Maybe because in the plan of salvation, he's considered the one God. But, uh, we know Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, but they have taken a subordinate position to the Father. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. Hebrews 1, 8 and 9. This is the Father speaking. And to the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness, the Holy Spirit, above thy fellows. So here the Father is saying, You are God to the Son, but He's saying to, to Jesus, I am your God. So here in this verse is two gods, which uh, totally disproves or, the Trinity doctrine that teaches one being who manifests himself in three ways. John 20, 17, very interesting verse. John talking, or Jesus talking to Mary, says, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to 
my God and your God. So the God of Jesus is the Father. And he's and the Father is our God, Jesus says. This is the same belief as Ellen White. She writes in Councils of Hell, 222, the Godhead was stirred, the Godhead was stirred with pity for the race, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working of the plan of salvation. What would it read if it was if she believed in the Trinity? Would she never ever use that word? What word would she use here? Himself. Would be himself. If she believed in the Trinity, she would have said himself, because it's one being. Unbelievably, they believe Trinitarian belief is that Jesus and the Father were the same being. She writes, "There are three living persons of the heavenly tree. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit." Uh, she she goes on and says that they will give their strength and power to help us overcome every sin and temptation. When we are baptized. When we are baptized, we're baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three living persons, each having a different role in our salvation. Great Controversy 583. It is as easy to make an idol of false doctrines and theories as to fashion an idol of wood or stone. She says, whoops. By misrepresenting the attributes of God, Satan leads men to conceive of him in a false character. With many, a philosophical idol is enthroned in the place of Jehovah. While the living God, as he is revealed in his word, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and in Christ, and in the works of creation, is worshipped by but few. And so the Father is the living God, according to Ellen White. When she uses the word God, she's, uh, unless she makes it clear she's talking about Jesus, she's always referring to the Father, one distinct person of the Godhead. And so the heavenly trio is right there in the 1872 Statement of Beliefs, with the Father being the Most High God, the Creator of all things. This was original Adventism that Ellen and James White lived with all their lives. And it wasn't changed till 1931. Before that happened, she had a vision in 1904. This, is, this was the vision of the Omega of apostasy. 1904. It's found in First Elected Messages 204 and 205. You have to remember this very important vi vision. This is also found in Daniel 11, 41, where the king of the north enters the glorious land. She says the enemies of souls, the enemy of souls, sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists. And that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom had given to the remnant church would be discarded. And these were the principles, the 1872 statement of SDA principles that she's talking about, would be discarded. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error, our religion would be changed. Yeah. Our religion would be changed. Those 1872 statement of principles would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. A what? A new organization. In uh, Second Celest Selected Messages 390, she said, we should not enter into any new organization for this would mean apostasy from the truth. That's been misused. Yes. Hmm. It's not separating from, a, from the apostasy. Mm -hmm. She means a reorganization of truth. And the shaking is in or out of truth, truth. not in or out of a church structure. Because if you stay in the church, you're, you're already shaken out of the truth. Mm -hmm. 
because the church is no longer on the Three Angels message. It's a new organization. It's a new organization. Mm -hmm. And books of a new order would be printed. How many have this book? For reference. <laughs> do, you, do you know uh, tw the ecumenicalism is written right in? Mm -hmm. That was given to me when I was baptized in yeah. 73. Yeah. That was a gift that was given to us. And it was given to every library in, New in the United States. Oh. She goes on, she says, a system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of the system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. <laughs> Can will this apostasy uh, repent? No. No. Nothing will be allowed to stand in the way. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but what? God being removed. God being removed would they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. And this is just what Brother John was teaching about the difference between human power and the power of God working in our lives. Their foundation would be built on sand, and everyone, storm and tempest, would sweep away the structure. That structure of truth is a different structure. And, uh, this is talking about the general conference, the Omega of Apostasy. Storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. The first change came in 1931. What happened there? Anyone know what happened in 1931? Marxism? Oh, that happened in the 20s. This was when the 1872 statements were replaced by an unofficial set, a new set of beliefs. And in this statement, the word Godhead was was equated with the word Trinity for the first time in an Adventist uh, document, official document. Well, this, uh, this statement makes you think that the Godhead is the same as the Trinity. And when you uplift uh, a false word with the true, the true word will decrease and the false word will increase. And that's what happened here in this statement. The word Trinity was first time used in, a, in an in official way in Adventism. Oh, by the way, this was 16 years after Alan White's death. Mm -hmm. Then in point number three of these statements, it says that Jesus Christ is very God, being of the same nature and essence as the Eternal Father. That's very Trinitarian. Yes. Um, because Trinitarians believe that it's the same identical essence and nature that cannot be divided. So the first came, change came in 19, the 1931 Statement of Beliefs. These had three effects. It raised the false term of Trinity to the level of equality with the term Godhead. The wording of point number three would be most agreeable to Trinitarians. And three, it made everyone forget that the 1872 Statement of Principles ever existed. This statement was not official, but it appeared in SDA yearbooks and manuals as if it was. In 1931. Thus, 15 years after the death of Ellen White, the words to Moses were fulfilled again. The Lord said unto Moses, or Ellen White, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will go, will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. So, 16 years after Ellen White's death, they start to uh, raise up the Trinity doctrine. Then, in 1955 and 56, came the secret meetings with Martin and Barnhouse, Walter Martin and Bar Donald Barnhouse. Walter Martin was going to write about a, a book about the cults. Mm -hmm. And he said, we're going to include seven Adventists in this book, but we first wanted to talk with you. 
It was in these meetings that the three doctrines of original Seventh-day Adventist Church were repudiated. The original and true Seventh-day Adventist Church were repudiated. And they said, um, you're going to have to accept three vital doctrines of orthodox, traditional, traditional Christianity in order to be accepted by the fallen Babylonian churches. This is the first doctrine. This was written in 1983, 25 years after the secret meetings. By this time, they could feel they felt free. They could talk about the meetings. It was published in Adventist Review. Unra, that Brother John mentioned, who started the ball rolling, he writes this article. What do you folks believe about the Trinity? It was a question put to me some years ago by two gracious Christian gentlemen who came unannounced to the Joan Conference headquarters in Washington, D.C. We assured the visitors... When we turn first to the scriptures, then to the fundamental beliefs of Adventism, what beliefs did they show him? Mm -hmm. 1931. They discovered that we were in harmony with sound biblical scholarship, not only on the Trinity, but on every other cardinal doctrine of Christianity. The evangelical conferences were satisfied when we were present that we were presenting contemporary Adventist doctrines because we were supported by the 1931 Statement of Fundamental Beliefs, which appeared regularly in official yearbooks and manuals of the church, but which was not really an official statement of beliefs. Wasn't the next official one would be 1980. And so Walter Martin published in the Eternity Magazine, November 1956, in an article entitled, What SDAs Really Believe, on the Doctrine of the Trinity, SDAs are solidly in the tradition of historic Orthodox Christianity. This is just a, a euphemism for what? For Roman Catholic Church. In the tradition. Um, the Trinity doctrine is a tradition. It started in 335 AD at the Council of Nicaea. It's a man made doctrine for a man made day of worship, Sunday worship, which came later in AD 64, 364. Donald Barnhouse wrote his public official article in his magazine, a public statement. The Adventists take their place in the very center of traditional. Christianity's Trinitarian doctrine. Not biblical Christianity's doctrine. Traditional. This was the new God accepted by the Adventist Church. Made official in 1980, statement of beliefs. This is what how it reads. There is one God, not Godhead, one God, colon, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co- Eternal beings, co-eternal beings, yeah, co-eternal beings, not eternal beings, co-eternal beings. Mm. That means they're only eternal with each other because they're all of the same identical essence that cannot be divided. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you look up World Council of Churches Constitution on the internet mm -hmm. and read the first statement, their definition of God is identical, <laughs> which was written in 1948. Constitution. Here's an illustration of the Catholic Trinity doctrine. The Father from all eternity. This is how they really say it. The Father is love and He loves Himself and from all eternity He, he, be he begets the Son. The, fa the Son is love and they love each other and together they produce the Holy Spirit. And you can see they are of the same identical essence that cannot be divided. And, the that, that yeah. and then here's another illustration of the Trinity. There's one God, one being, who manifests himself in three persons. And in the Trinity doctrine, persons does not mean persons. It means emanation of the one God. There. And there's the word that uh, the essence is not divided, and they're co-eternal, and that one God is manifested in three persons. From in the 2006 Sabbath School Quarterly, talking about uh, the Holy Spirit on the subject, the first lesson on the triune God, 
There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. In other words, Adventists, along with millions of other Christians, believe in the triune nature of God. Triune is a code word for Trinity. It means the same thing. Uh, three in one. They believe in the tr three in one nature of God. That is, there is one God who exists as three persons. Then they ask this question, right in the lesson. What analogies, such as a three-pronged fork, can help someone understand the idea of how one God can be composed of three equal persons? Three-pronged fork? That's the trident. How can you put a question like that in the Adventist quarterly? Why didn't they ask, how, how does a singing trio yeah. help us to understand right. the heavenly trio? Right. Mm -hmm. okay. In the three angels' messages, we have the command to worship the Creator that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters in the first angel's message. That's a command to worship the Father, the Creator. In the third angel's message, we are commanded not to worship the beast in his image. The beast represents the Roman Catholic Church system, and the image represents the fallen Protestant Church systems. These will, this is when the image will be a church-state system, like the beast is a church-state system. But we don't worship those church systems. What do we worship? The God of the... They worship the God in those systems. And what God is in those systems? It's the Trinity... One God composed of three persons. And the fallen Protestant churches worship the Trinity too. So we have a command to worship the true God and don't worship the false God. And this lines up with two historic Adventist documents. The 1872 Statement of Beliefs worships the true God, while the 1980 Statement of Beliefs worship the God we're not to worship. So, we, so the Elijah message is here and the three angels' messages. Choose you this day whom you will worship. We need to go back to the old paths of Adventism. To the faith once delivered to the saints. James White wrote, as fundamental errors we might... As what? Fundamental mm -hmm. errors. errors. We might class with the counterfeit Sabbath other errors. Such as sprinkling for baptism. The Trinity. The consciousness of the dead. And eternal life and misery. Mm -hmm. The mass who have the mass of people who have held these fundamental errors have doubtless done it ignorantly, but can it be supposed that the Church of Christ will carry along with her these errors till the judgment scenes burst upon the world? We think not. But 127 years later, the Adventist Church chose to adopt this fundamental error as a fundamental belief. The second doctrine who Jesus is, who's lost. The true, the true Christ, who came in our sinful fl flesh, was traded away for a Catholic Jesus, who came in sinless flesh of Adam before the fall. Yeah. The Bible teaches, Hebrews 2.14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, Jesus also himself likewise took part of the same. Very clear. But Hebrews 2 goes on. For verily he took not on him the nature of Abraham, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Yeah, not the nature of angels. That would be sinless flesh. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. That would be sinful flesh. Fallen humanity. And we do not believe in original sin. But we do believe that we inherit the effects of Adam's sin in our bodies. Hebrews 2.17 Wherefore in all things it behoo behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Very clear. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Amen. Hebrews 4.15 And a white writes, But when Adam was assailed by the tempter, none of the effects of sin were upon him. Christ took upon him the infirmities right. of degenerate humanity. Only thus could he rescue man from the lowest depths of his degradation. Mm -hmm. Desire of Ages 117. Our Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. Mm -hmm. In the Bible, in Exodus chapter 
12, you have the lintel and the two side posts, where you would take the blood and you would strike. You would strike first the lintel, then the two side posts. And the lintel represents the Father who remains in heaven. He's the Most High God. He never, he never touches the earth. If he did, we would be destroyed. But he sent two side posts into the world. One was Michael, the angel of the Lord. And in the New Testament, Jesus Christ, the same, the same being. And the other side post, the Holy Spirit. All three have suffered in the plan of salvation. And this door represents Christ's humanity, which was like ours. And Christ's, Christ's humanity was not hinged on his divinity. His humanity was hinged on the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. He, and all three of these are distinct elements of the door. Working together in perfect harmony for our salvation, the doorway of salvation. Up here represents heaven, and Jesus links earth with heaven, so does the Holy Spirit. And um, it's through them that we can understand who the Father is. The, Paul talks about him as the unknown God. And so publicly, uh, Walter Martin could say that SDAs are solidly in the tradition of historic Orthodox Christianity on the perfect human nature of Christ during the Incarnation. The SDA Church repudiated them. Ellen White says, are they, she says, where are the watchmen that ought to be standing on the walls of Zion? Are they asleep? Mm. One faithful watchman on the walls of Zion was M. L. Andreas. And he wrote a book called Letters to the Churches to warn SDAs of the apostasy that occurred before his eyes. And, uh, how many have heard of that book, Letters to the Churches? You can, you can get copies today. Download it off the internet or buy a book online. Letters to the Churches. Uh, he was the only one who protested. Barnhouse wrote, Martin pointed out to them in their bookstore adjoining the building, this is what Brother John talked about, in which the meetings were taking place, a certain volume published by them, written by one of their ministers, categoric that categorically stated the contrary to what they were now asserting. Excuse me, John. Uh, oh, oh. Who wrote the book, uh, Letters to the Churches? M. L. Andreas. M. L. Andreas. M. L. Andreas. He was one of the he was one of the leading Adventist pastors during that time. He was a uh, Norwegian, Scandinavian person. So they found a book in the bookstore that was uh, that was saying just different from, from what the Adventist leaders were asserting that they believed. We said, but this book says you believe different. The leader sent for the book, discovered that Mr. Martin was correct, and immediately brought this back to the attention of the general conference officers that this situation might be remedied and such publications be corrected. Right. Mm. Yeah. The same, this same procedure was repeated regarding the nature of Christ while in the flesh. Yeah. Right. Right. That's why you will never see an Adventist book published since 1955-56 that teaches the truth about Christ's humanity. So if that's true, what is, does that mean? That means they're teaching a false Christ. A false Christ. False Christ. Wow. What does yeah. Jesus warn us about? Beware of false, 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 false Christ. Christ. Mm -hmm. False teachings. Yeah. Wow. So the same procedure was followed, which the majority, and they said, uh, the majority of the denomination has always held to be what? Sinless. sinless, holy, and perfect, despite the fact that certain of their writers have occasionally gotten into print with contrary views completely repugnant to the church at large. Oh this was a public <laughs> statement. <laughs> a public statement. Wow. They further explained to Mr. Martin that they had among their numbers certain members of their lunatic branch. Yeah. Wow. That's That's we are. Are. That's yeah. You know, this, okay, this is praise. Who wants to be alone? <laughs> this phrase is found not only in Adventism, other denominations use the same yeah. term with, with their lunatic fringe. 
even as they are similar, wild-eyed irresponsibles mm. in every field of fundamental mm. Christianity. Mm. Andreasen wrote this in the first letter. I think this is going too far. Mrs. White did not belong to the lunatic fringe who got into print, nor did the authors of Bible readings. Our leader should make a most humble apology to the denomination for such a slur upon their members. It is almost unbelievable that they should, that they, that they, that they should ever have made such statements. But the, but the accusation has been in print nearly three years, and there has been no protest of any kind. I am humiliated that such accusations should have been made, and even more so that, the, that our leaders are completely callous in their attitude toward them. I think these statements are ample ground for impeachment. Yeah. Hmm. Now that's a true statement, but Adventist lay members have no avenue or authority to yeah. impeach or right. bring the leaders to right. uh, the spiritual <laughs> judgment. They've got immunity. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Our members are largely yeah. unaware of the conditions yeah. existing, and every effort is being made to keep them in mm -hmm. ignorance. Orders have been issued to keep everything secret, and it will be noted that even in the late general conference session in Cleveland, Ohio, where I grew up, no report was given of our leaders trafficking with the evangelicals and making alliances with them. Our officials are playing with fire, and the resulting conflagration will fulfill the prediction that the coming Omega will be of a most startling nature. So here he identifies this time, this event as the Omega of Apostasy. Seven times I have asked for a hearing, and I have been promised one, but only on the condition that I meet privately with certain men, and that no record be given me of the proceedings. I have asked for a public hearing, or if it to be a private one, that a tape recording be made, and that I be given a copy. This has been denied me, and as I cannot have such a hearing, I am writing these messages, which contain and will contain what I would have said at such a hearing. Can the reader surmise the reason why the officers do not want the hearing, I ask? I am a Seventh-day Adventist, and I love this message that I have preached for so long. I grieve deeply as I see the foundation pillars being destroyed, just like Alan White predicted. The blessed truths that have made us what we are, abandoned or discarded, thrown into the historical trash. trash here. Mm -hmm. So now the third doctrine repudiated. The SDA church leaders lost where Jesus is when they agreed that Christ's work in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary was not vital for mm -hmm. our salvation. Instead, it was all done at the cross. That's what they talk about. Yeah. House wrote publicly. They do not believe, as some of their earlier teachers taught, that Jesus' atoning work was not completed on the Calvary, but instead that he was still carrying on second ministering work since 1844. This idea is also totally repudiated. Then Barnhouse quotes Froome. We, and Froome says, we totally reject, this is Froome talking, we totally reject the concept of a dual atonement. All SDAs are in harmony with the teaching of the General Conference, not the Bible, and that Jesus Christ shed his blood upon the cross once for all. And it was on that perfect sacrifice alone, and Christ completed atonement, that they have rested and do now rest all hope for their salvation. Mm -hmm. Alan, <laughs> but the truth is, as Ellen White writes, the intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death on the cross. By his death, <coughs> he began that work which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. This is seen in the sanctuary, which we'll, we'll see. Martin and Barnhouse hated two people. They disliked two people. One was Ellen White, <coughs> the other was O.L. Crozier. O.L. Crozier wrote a wonderful article called The Sanctuary. And Ellen White says, The Lord showed me in vision more than a year ago that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary. 
that it was God's will <coughs> that Brother Crozier should write out the view which he gave us in the Daystar Extra, February 7, 1846. <coughs> I feel fully authorized by the Lord to recommend that extra to every Adventist saint. How many have read O.L.L. Crozier's The Sanctuary? You can download this on the internet <coughs> or read it. And it's also called The Lay of Moses by O.R.L. Crozier. Okay. I think, though, if you type The Sanctuary, O.L.L. Crozier, you can find, find that. Crozier writes this. But again, in, and in his day, what, what year did he write this in? 1846. And he writes, But again, they say the atonement was made and finished on Calvary. When the Lamb of God expired, so men have taught us, and so the churches would have us to believe, and world believe. Um, so in Crozier's time, 1846, he was dealing with the same false doctrine. But it is none the more true or sacred on that account, if unsupported by divine authority. And he has a section in his article that says, The atonement was not made and finished at Calvary. One, if the atonement was made on Calvary, by whom was it made? The making of the atonement is the work of a priest. Right. But who officiated on Calvary? Roman soldiers and wicked Jews. It's a priest that makes an atonement. The slaying of the victim was not the making of the atonement. The sinner slew the victim. Right. After that, the priest took the blood and made the atonement. Christ was the appointed high priest to make the atonement, and he certainly could not have acted in that capacity till after his resurrection. And we have no record of his doing anything on earth <coughs> after his resurrection, which could be called the atonement. Four, the atonement was made in the sanctuary, but Calvary was out in the courtyard. He could not, according to Hebrews 8.4, make the atonement while on earth. If he were on earth, he should not be a priest. The Levitical was the earthly priesthood. The divine, or the Melchizedek, was the heavenly. Therefore, he, could, he did not begin the work of making the atonement, whatever the nature of that work may be, till after his ascension, whereby, when by his own blood, he entered his heavenly sanctuary for us. And in the sanctuary, Leviticus 4, 31, it says, Who shall make the atonement? The priest. The priest. The priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven. On the 14th day of the first month in the spring, what happened there? A feast day. That was the Passover. But on the 10th day of the seventh month, this was the beginning of the year, which represented the beginning of Christianity, the Christian age. But then at the end of the Christian age, in the tenth day of the seventh month, in the autumn, was the Day of Atonement. How could the atonement be completed here? Hmm. It is clear that if the atonement on the cross was final, there cannot be a later atonement also final. Leviticus okay. 1630, this is about the Day of Atonement chapter. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you, to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And that's a wonderful work of cooperation with the Holy Spirit, to clean our body temple as well, as Jesus is working to cleanse the most holy place of all the sins that should be brought there before the latter rain falls. Barnhouse wrote, the assumption that Christ had a work to perform in the most holy place before coming to this earth is a human, face-saving idea which some uninformed Adventists carry to fantastic, literalistic extremes. Mr. Martin and I heard the Adventist leaders say flatly that they repudiated all mm -hmm. such extremes. This they said in no uncertain terms. Further, they do not believe, as some of their earlier teachers taught, that Jesus' atoning work was not completed on Calvary, but instead that he was still carrying on a second ministering, ministering work since 1844. This idea is also totally repudiated. They believe that since his ascension, Christ has been ministering the benefits of the atonement, which he completed on Calvary. Mm -hmm. 
this is a public statement that the Adventist Church has to publicly repent of before God can use it again. But Anna White says nothing will be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. There will be no repentance. Andreasen says, to me, to repudiate Christ's ministry in the second apartment mm. now is to repudiate Adventism. Mm. Mm. This is part of the foundation pillars of Adventism. If we reject the atonement in the sanctuary now, we may as well repudiate all Adventism. Yeah. Mercy. Come on now. For this, God's people are not ready. They will not follow the leaders in apostasy. One of the main pillars of our faith has, according to eternity, been removed. Shall we stand idly by and permit the sanctuary to be trodden underfoot? And that by its supposed supporters? So here we see Satan's attack on the most holy place. It's an attempted attack. But Jesus said, I have opened a door which what? No man, no man can shut. And so they have attempted to shut it. But the laymen are going to finish the work. And... and and they're going to point to Christ's ministry in the most holy place, although the Catholic Church will plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain and try to block that view. But he will not be successful. Andreasen goes on, I weep for my people, weep for you. Who's you? Our, our figure, president of the SDA Church. Hmm. Um, He says, I weep for you. This is the apostasy foretold long ago, and I am sorry that you are involved in it. I have counted the cost, and it will be to me to continue my opposition. And you is the president of the General Conference. General Conference is the omega of apostasy. It's not women's ordination, and it's not spiritual formation. It's the General Conference that's allowing these things. The omega of apostasy. He says, I am trying to save my beloved denomination from what? Committing suicide. suicide. The 1872 Statement of Beliefs. There's the first doctrine repudiated. That there's one God, the Father. The Father repudiated. That Jesus Christ took on him the nature of the seed of Abraham. The second doctrine repudiated. The true Jesus repudiated. And that he was going into the most holy place to begin his final, a final work of atonement for our sins. This was the third doctrine repudiated. The, holy, the work of the Holy Spirit cooperating with Christ. And the very serious thing now, it's for being a faithful watchman, Andreasen's ministerial, ministerial mm. credentials mm. were taken away. Wow. Mm. And he took away his denominational mm. retirement. Wow. He had to apply to the California State Welfare Office so that he and his wow. wife could survive. Wow. But the government officials there asked him to explain the situation, and when they learned that the SDA Church had illegally stopped his retirement sustentation, they contacted the SDA leaders and told them that they would begin legal proceedings against wow. the General Conference to recover his rightful sustentation. Wow. And so they again renewed his payments, but they never, uh, he remained stripped of his minister, ministerial credentials. And a few years later, he died of a bleeding ulcer. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. Stress. The battle had cost him his life. Mm. But Barnhouse could write, the position of the Adventist seems to some of us in certain cases to be a new position, a new structure of truth. Mm. To them it may be merely the position of the majority group of same leadership. Really, should be an really? I-N. I I wow. <laughs> which in, is determined, you know, the lunatic friend. <laughs> which is determined to put the brakes on any members who seek to hold views divergent from that of the responsible leadership of the denomination. In 1959, the, the Adventist Church published this book. Has anyone seen this book? No. Heard. Never heard of it. It's laying right there on your coffee table. Okay, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> now I see it. Now I see it. <laughs> But it 
was a compilation of the best, 47 best articles from the Signs of the Times. And the first article was written by James White. Wow. and contained the 1872 Statement of Principles. When the principal, when the president of the Joe Conference read that first chapter, that the atonement was not made on the cross, he ordered the books that had already been bound, several hundred that had already been shipped, and 2,000 unbound signatures destroyed. Wow. So you, you ne no one, no Adventist really no, has ever seen that book before. Can you get more? Um, in the story that I read, uh, Andreessen bought two from the bookstore before they, before they got his order. Was wow. Wow. And so I found one on, online. But I don't know, I haven't looked. But you can download the digital version. Okay. okay. Yeah. Living Witness by Richard Lewis. L-E-W? L-E-W-I-S. Uh, Living Witness by Richard Lewis. But 47 excellent articles from Signs of the Times from 1874 to 19-something. It was published in 1959. Ellen White writes, nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. And the result of denying the one God, Christ, and the truth, the Holy Spirit, Barnhouse could write, in conclusion, I'd like to say that we are delighted to do justice to a much maligned group of sincere believers and in our minds and hearts acknowledge them as redeemed brethren and members of the what? body, of, body Christ. of Christ. And if you read uh, point number 14, point number 12, the church, the church is the body of Christ. Yeah. Unim, unity. And number 14 is unity in the body of Christ, which means an ecumenical unity with all the Christian churches. Mm -hmm. yeah. The General Conference was welcomed by Protestants as a sister church mm -hmm. in the holy place. Mm -hmm. Our religion would be changed, the principles of truth discarded. Jude 3 and 4, beloved, ye should what? Earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the Adventist saints. Yeah. The saints. The saints. Yeah, but the, in our day it's the pioneer saints. Yeah. To the saints, it's the same thing. Um, <laughs> For there are certain men crept in unawares. John Graz, William Johnson, Angel Rodriguez, and B.B. Beach. These are... Uh, Angel Rodriguez? Yes. Did he find them too? Oh, he's an arch ecumenical. I think you're being sarcastic. Wow. No, I, I oh. didn't know that he was. Oh. I didn't know that. Um, these are arch... These leaders in the ecumenical movement, along with Jan Paulson, and oh, yeah. president oh, yeah. of Andrews University, and John, John Dibdahl, and... The um, woman that's the president, the current president of the Andrews? Uh, There's a female. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know they got a new president. Yeah, they do. But um, uh, Phineas, he had to throw a javelin. And these are javelins of light. And calls for repentance. That these, these men should be disfellowshipped. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Denying what? The only Holy Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly what happened in the 1955 and 56 message. Again, we have two worship, two gods were warned in the three angels' messages. One that we're to worship, one we're not to worship, and two historical Adventist documents lining up with the truth and with error. So the, we're not making up anything. This is history, messages from heaven, with historical documents. Mm. The Elijah message is in the three angels' messages. Two worships, two days of worship, two gods, two different gods. And if this is the true God today, that means this is a false God. Yeah. Wow. Mm. And then the SDA leaders were led by a false God, and the 1844 movement was false. Exactly. But if this is the true God, and then that's the false God, and we are in a great apostasy. We are in the omega of apostasy. We call the General Conference to repent publicly of what it did in 1955 and 56, and officialized in 1980. 
we can go this way, and we can get a good temporary job in the seven last plagues, <laughs> or we can go this way and experience the buy and sell decree and the death decree, but we will receive eternal life. Okay. Amen. 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 <laughs> we need to count the cards. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the mark of the beast or the seal of God? Seal of God. Seal of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. count, the count the cards. As for the old path, Jeremiah says, where is the good way? Walk the <coughs> way, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Mm. But they said, we will not walk there. So this verse in Jeremiah, Jeremiah's talking more for our day than he was for them. Books of a New Order would be printed that teaches those three doctrines that they repudiated. Cottrell said, quote, was, this is his quote in 1958, were Seventh-day Adventists to yield their distinctive teachings in order to win and wear the robe of theological respectability, they would doubtless be accepted by other Christian bodies. But in so doing, they would be traitor to the truths that have made them a people. They would no longer be Seventh-day Adventists. Did he get in trouble too? No. <laughs> no. I don't think so. Hmm. Revelation 2 9, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And the name Seb Davis was copyrighted in 1981. Ellen White's prediction fulfilled. The principles, 1872 principles, would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of the New Order printed. 25 years later, 1960, or, or it says that it would, he says it would take time to, for the denomination to get the divergent literature to be brought under editorial control and mm. harmonize with the declared denominational position. Adventists are seriously studying the problem. In 1860, 1960, Andrews University was formed for the first time. Our first oh. university. Because now we're not, we're a real church, not a cult. So now we, we can... We're part of the system of university. Oh. Today, the General Conference is in, in 1980, when they made the 27 statements, it took them off the platform of the Three Angels Messages. And this is the new platform. It's an ecumenical platform. Ecumenicalism was written right in there. A new Catholic God was accepted into the church. Mm. This is SDA belief number two, number three, number four, number five. It takes four beliefs in the new doctrine. And here's the definition of the church. The church is defined as the community of believers who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Who would fall into that category? And then... The remnant church is defined as part of the universal church. Mm -hmm. And then point number 13 is unity in the body of Christ. That's, that's this church here. Mm -hmm. And it's based on belief in the Trinity, mm -hmm. point number two. Um, this is exactly what John, John Paul II teaches in his encyclical, Ut Unum Sent, yeah, 1995. Yeah. And it's in point number eight of that encyclical where he says, our unity is based on the belief of the blessed Trinity. Listen to this, where the president of Walla Walla College was under oath, and the lawyer asked him, does the word church, you know, where the college has this, has this book, book where they offer the courses, and they describe the courses, and the, and the introduction says, uh, does the word church in the phrase church's unique mission to the world mean and refer to the Adventist church? Not exclusively. Lawyer. So it means churches generally? Yes. The Christian Church. Mm. So, so words are used very deceptively in some of these books. The church is the community of believers who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Who falls under this definition? Everybody. Okay, not only the not only the Adventist Church, but the Presbyterian Church, mm. the Methodist Church, the Church of God, all the all in all worlds and all the bottom and all crosses. The Baptist Church and the Church of Christ and the Nazarene Church and the Lutheran Church and the Catholic Church and the and the Assemblies of God and the Coptic Greek Church and the Coptic Church 
and as well as the Dallas Theological Seminary. They oh, no. Wow. So, so the flame actually re reflects ecumenism. Well, question, brother, question. Yeah. The flame, the significance of the flame? The flame seems to reflect yeah. the ecumenical movement okay. because so many other churches use the flame as well. Yes. What that means, it must be a spirit coming out of this. Here's the definition of when you... Uh, the World Council of Churches is a fellowship of churches which confess the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior. That's as, exactly as point number 12 of the Adventist Church Statements. According to the Scriptures, and therefore seek to fulfill together their common calling to the glory of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Exactly the same as point number 2 and point number 12 of the 28 statements, 27 statements. There's SBA belief number 12 and number 2. In the exact words of the World Council of Churches. So, in the 27 statements, there's no second angel's message, no definition of the second angel's message, no identification of Babylon or God calls to come out of her. There's no third angel's message, no identification of the beast as the image or the mark. 1993, George Knight says, most of the founders of Seventh-day Adventism would not be allowed to join the church That's today right. Right. if they had to subscribe to the denomination's <laughs> fundamental beliefs. He spoke the truth. He did. <laughs> More specifically, most would not be able to agree to belief number two, which deals with the doctrine of the huh. Trinity. Well, still, there's still a few standing up. Our religion would be changed. Ellen White's a true prophet. This is, this is proving that Ellen White is a true prophet. After 26 years, Walter Martin writes to the General Conference, do you still officially, do you still hold to what we officially agreed upon in questions on doctrines, 1957, and the Adventist Church answered officially, yes. yes. Absolutely. The new logo was uh, changed in 1995 mm -hmm. for this one. Now the question is, if these are flames, uh, how high does this cross go? It goes way up to there, doesn't it? Yeah. Right up to there. Oops. Three angels depiction is gone. Now the Presbyterian Church, they have a very similar logo. And it has all the things that are in the Adventist Church. It has the cross, the pulpit, a dove, a fish, a cup. A fish. Oh. Flat, the fire, charismatic fire, the book, and what? Trinity. A secret trinity there. You would never think there's a trinity there, but there is a trinity there. And there's, is there a trinity there? Yes, at the bottom. There's a trinity there, and there's a trinity there. How so? Well, this is a triangle here. Okay. Actually, on the Adventist logo, if you go back, if in fact the cross, goes up to the top? No. Yeah. If the cross yeah. goes up to the top, then that makes that cross upside down. Upside yeah. down, yes. Yeah. That yeah. makes what? Well, well, cross upside down. We're like see that. like the, um, the little bird there, it looks like he's making a nose die. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's not a good thing. What do you see the bird in? Well, you know, to me, it's like there. when they have the no, thing. No, no, no. It's yeah, like it's, this is no, a fish. Like, I like, know, it's, yeah. it's a fish in the something. Yeah. No, but the Adventist logo, is it in the Adventist logo also? No, it's not in the Adventist logo. No. Elder, Jones, Elder Jones' question. What was the reason for the change in the logo, do you know? Well, it's to hide the three angels' messages. Right. The three angels' oh, messages. but they would never own it as that. Yeah, no, I went to the general 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 general. General. What was their logic? Was that their oh, thinking well, behind? Their thought is that these, so. these represent the three angels' messages. Right. There's wow. another, wow. There's another um, depiction of that, that logo. With the sphere in the middle of it. Yeah, that. there's supposed to be a world around right? A world sphere. Right. right. Mm -hmm. But notice how this is so similar to this one. This is the Dallas Theological Center. Yeah, that's what I was Here is the Adventist, uh, Sister Wendy, there's the Adventist logo, close up. And notice how it fits over there into oh, the, the upside down cross. The yeah. upside down cross. And who? <coughs> that's the cross of Peter, the first pope. Oh, yeah, that's right. oh. The new, the, the new God being taught in the Adventist Church. Right. 
Don't turn that down. <laughs> in this book, Our Awesome God, it says, it's a basic Christian doctrine that God is a trinity of three mm. persons. Persons meaning modes of eternal manifestation, mm. having one substance, mm. essence, or being. It took the Adventist Church until far into the 19th century to agree that the doctrine of the Trinity was indeed biblical and belonged among the fundamental Adventist beliefs. Mm, wow. In 1999, this is a, something you, you've never heard about. Uh, the Polish SDA Church made an agreement with the Catholic Church. They said, the SDA Church in its teaching and service cultivates the most important principles mm. of Catholic faith, especially the belief in the Blessed Trinity. Whoa. Cultivates the most important. Mm -hmm. So, we should earnestly contend for the faith. Ungodly men coming in. Two gods to choose from in the three angels' messages. And we covered that. I want to tell you this. Story. The slave making ants. Did you know that there are slave making ants? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. The slave-making ants cannot survive without mm. slaves. They lack <laughs> the ability to tend the queen, mm. raise young, and mm. hunt for food. They can only survive by making slaves of other ant species. Mm. Mm. Experiments have shown that when slave-makers are separated from their slave, they will starve to death, even though food is made available to them. Mm. There are two distinct methods that slave-making ants use to take over a colony. First, most commonly, Worker slave making ants will raid the colony of another species of ants and secrete a chemical that causes the ants to evacuate the nest. In their haste to leave, the pupae, pupae will be left behind. The slave making ants steal the eggs and bring them back to their own nest. A typical colony of 3,000 slave making ants may have more than 6,000 slaves working mm -hmm. for it. These youngsters mature in the slaver's nest and labor as in it as if it were their own. They even join raids against their own species. Mm. Another method used by slave-making ants is replacing the queen of the captive colony. The young slave-making queen will follow a group of raiding slave-makers into the new colony. As the worker slave-makers raid this colony for eggs, the queen takes advantage of the, va of the battle <laughs> to sneak into the colony. The queen quickly searches and locates the Formica queen and with her adapted mandibles, proceeds to bite and lick various parts of the Formica Queen for an average of 25 minutes. The new queen mimics the old queen by consuming pheromones from her body and releasing them to the attending ants. Within seconds of the host queen's death, the nest undergoes a most remarkable transformation. The Formica workers cease aggression and start to groom the slave-making queen as if it were their own. The takeover now complete, the slave-making queen gains not only a nest, but a worker cast as well. Do you see the lesson? This new queen, having mated with a slave-making male earlier, begins to lay her eggs and produce new slave-makers. Workers of the two species coexist in a single nest for a period of after, after the parasite queen has assumed reproduction and before the last remaining host workers die off. The slave making ants was duplicated in 1955 and 56, was made official in 1980, when a new false god was installed in the SDA church and a million SDA members began to work for a new god and didn't even know it. The king of the north shall enter into the glorious land and many shall be overthrown. For there are certain men crept in unaware, denying God and the only Lord Jesus Christ. What should we do? We should stand well guarded and firm, giving no countenance to those. We thought it would be people from outside, but no, it's the leaders who would unsettle the established faith of the body. God looked upon this separated company standing on the truth with approbation. I was shown three steps. The first, second, and third angel's messages. Woe to him who shall move what? 
of love. Of love. Or stir a pen of these messages. That means it's a structure of truth. The true understanding of these messages is of vital importance. The destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are received. So God bless us to stand firmly on the platform of truth, to buy the products that Brother John said, the white raiment, the gold tried in the fire, and to anoint our eyes with heavenly eyes. Mm -hmm. Amen. And what does buy mean? Amen. It means to make an effort. Mm. Mm. Morning and evening, personal family worship. Yes. Um, we need to be restored. Mm -hmm. We need to overcome as Jesus overcame. And notice in these verses you have Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. We need to worship the true God and let them work for our salvation. The first angel's message cleanses us from individual sin. The second angel's message cleanses us from corporate sin. The third angel is a call, don't go back into sin. And God's true people will be standing on the platform of righteousness by faith, resting in Jesus, waiting for Christ's second coming, firmly on that platform. How many want to stand firmly on the three angels' messages today? Amen. Let's stand. Raise your hand. We can stand. And uh, how many have been baptized since 1955 and 56? <laughs> into a false theology. Yeah, yeah, secular yeah. false theology. Yeah, it was really into a false theology. Second yeah. step. <laughs> into a false theology. Probably every yeah. one of us here. The Three Angels' Messages is a movement of people. This will be repeated in, in the fourth angel, joining with the Three Angels' Messages, giving the loud cry. It will be a loud cry to the whole world. And it will be completed by laymen. Just like it was in Christ's day. It will be, and we're living in that same situation. Where Christ and the disciples had the truth. But the leaders were trying. Satan was using the leaders to block the light. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So the three angels messages. And I wanted to ask. How many want to give their heart, mind, soul and strength. To the cause of the three angels messages. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about how to do that. But first let's have yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Let's kneel together for prayer. Father in heaven, we are living in a serious sort of time where things are happening without as well as within. And we see that you have given us a tremendous responsibility. We thank you for the three angels messages, the present truth for this time. We pray that you would bless us to buy the things that you've counseled us to get in the Laodicean message and to understand and, and experience the three angels messages to stand firmly on that platform at this time. Well guarded, sure. Giving no countenance to those that would unsettle the established faith of the body. Bless us to have faith and courage at this time and to work together to help swell the messages, the three angels' messages, to a loud cry. Bless each one that is here. Send them forth with your Holy Spirit. Send each of us with your Holy Spirit that we might see the doors of opportunity to share the truth with others. Hmm. And please bless our family members that we're praying for in a special way as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you.